You know why they have a second album crisis, every band? Um, well, everyone was a crisis with us, but when you have the second album crisis, so when you do your first album, you've been playing that, all that material for a while before you go into the studio, you know. But the second one is like, you have to start from scratch. It was like, can you go somewhere and write the new album? What do you mean, second album? And it, we weren't really ready to make a second album. I think it took it so much out of us to make the first album. So we went to Jamaica and do some songs and we were just so overwhelmed by, by being there that we didn't do, actually do very much writing. We came up with some tunes like um, for the second album, Tommy Gun, Safe European Home, what have you. But mostly I remember trying to find Lee Perry in Kingston. Um, I don't know how we weren't filleted and served up on a bed of chips because me and Mick wandered around the harbour. I think they mistook us for sailors, merchant seamen, because we were walking around Kingston dressed up in our full punk regalia. They must have just let us pass because we were like, they probably thought we were madmen or something. But me and Mick didn't have a clue what we were doing there or we didn't know anybody or anything. We were just wandering around in Kingston like lunatics. And we couldn't, we never found Lee Perry either. What I realised is when they were sent there, I was going, hold on a minute, I thought I was a Jamaican fanatic in the band, but anyway. So I got a, a cheap ticket to go to uh, a package tour to Moscow and uh, and then I came back with all these stars, which became adopted by the class. So something came positive out of that. And behind the scenes, I think they were pressuring Bernie to, to bring in something. They wanted to bring an American end into it. And Bernie selected Sandy Perlman off a list of producers that were presented to him as likely candidates by Columbia. I got a message from uh, Dan Loggins, who used to be the head of uh, A&R at CBS, and he said, hey, we need you to come to London as soon as possible, and we're going to take you around the country and show you a bunch of bands. And if you're interested in producing any of them, groovy. So we went in, and uh, I was there was a bunch of guys from CBS, and uh, Apparently, the uh, sound dude sig uh, signaled the clash that I was in the house. And uh, so they began by announcing, uh, we're going to play a song, uh, and we want to dedicate it to Journey and Ted Nugent. And I think they left Bruce Springsteen out, but they mentioned a bunch of big AOR-ish bands uh, that were big in the late 70s, and most of all, the Blue Oyster Cult. This is We're So Bored or I'm So Bored with the USA. And there we are. I really enjoyed working with Sandy Perlman. It was the first time I'd been in a, you know, to record an album in a proper studio. And he was very complimentary about my drumming, which meant uh, there immediately there was an affinity between us. And you got a great drum sound. In the case of Topper, we had one of the greatest drummers ever to be dropped upon the face of the earth. I called him the human drum machine, but that was unfair to him. He was beyond any conceivable, even 21st century evolution of the concept of a drum machine or a virtual drum machine. He was. Awesome. Sandy Perlman, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a great fella and he's good at his job being a producer. But for me, I, I suppose it sort of showed my flaws in my bass playing because I, cause when I first met Mick, I never played an in instrument in my life. And I reckon it's probably, what, six months before we, yeah. we did our first well, live show. So I was quite sort of rough. One of the things I pride myself on is getting good or great performances out of everybody, no matter what their skill level might have been before I walked in. 
And I said, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm, we'll just have him play it, and he'll get it right, and it'll be great. And, you know, I, I'm biased, of course, uh, but, you know, I think we got a really great result, and nothing was replaced. Come the time we did the second out of the third album, London Calling, if I made a mistake, I'd tell Guy Stevens that, oh, Guy, I slipped up on, on brand new Cadillac. He said, it, it sounds great. It sounds like a Cadillac going out of control. So I had the, more an affinity with Guy Stevens than I did with Sandy Perlman. I'm really happy to have mistakes and imperfection. It's just, it's kind of, should sort of resemble the scale that the rest of the stuff is in. And so, you know, that's re really where I pushed the button. It was not like, I'm not a fanatic about that. In fact, I, I, I on Guns on the Roof, Joe did not, at the, at the end of a particularly great take, he burst a blood vessel in his mouth. And he said, this time I will try and reproduce the accent, got blood in me mouth. If you listen to the recording, it's there. And I put it in, you know, I kept it. He didn't want it kept. I said, this is awesome. I'm not throwing this out. These are the things that make doing this kind of stuff worthwhile. By the second album, it wasn't a case of bashing the stuff out. It was getting more like a rock scenario where you're churning it out. It was getting a bit dull, so Paul Simron got hold of a projector and some World War II footage and would sh play, them on the, play them on the studio wall. But then he got into running them backwards, which sort of took the edge off it because it became You'd see implosions and zeros coming out of destroyers and battleships. It was generally mad, the whole thing. I came out of the control room for some reason. I noticed that all of the potted plants in the studio had been dumped on the ground of this big common room. And uh, the plants themselves, all of the soil from the potted plants, and the plants had been artfully placed around the room. They had created a trials course <laughs> or something, and they were writing these. We couldn't really hear it because of the uh, soundproofing in the studio in the control room, but they were riding these trail bikes around the course that they had created. And I think it was the third day, and I said to, uh, to Mick and Joe, anything we're going to do here, I think we need to finish by about 3 o'clock in the morning four o'clock because I don't think we will ever be left wet back in this place. Joe and I, we were, went to San Francisco and um, we were going to do the overdubs and we did in San Francisco at the Automat there with Sandy. And, uh, but we were getting fed up as well and we were like, listen, we're going on strike unless these two can come over. Otherwise, we're, we're laying down tools now. It's kind of an overlooked album to a certain extent for us, you know, but I was surprised when Mick said they only wrote a couple of songs in Jamaica. Yeah. Because like Julie's been working for the drug squad was great. Tommy Gunn was great. Where did I'm just wondering where they came from? Tommy Gunn. Tommy Gunn, which of course I love the lyrics. The guitar sounds were great. We had really our little odyssey in recording and mixing this, which finally brought us to New York in the record plant. And they had built an overdub room, as I said, and the overdub room had a huge thick glass window, thick glass window into the control room, hardwood floors, and hardwood walls. Maybe it's just some drywall as well. It's extremely reflective. And more of the point, since it, the building had a steel frame, you could get the frame to resonate. You could get the whole room to resonate if you turn things up hideously loud. Topper, he had an awesome, awesome drum sound, uh, including, you know, his snare sound. So we turned the tape over, played him the tape backwards, and he played the snare drum to the backwards tape, which gave, if you're familiar with the song, if you remember it, it has this fantastic sucking, crunching sound at the leading and trailing edge of each snare strike. And that was why it was done. We didn't realize how the first album sounded weird, really, to American record company people, and they weren't keen to release it at all. And so they released the second album and then the first album. But the audience was way beyond them. The audience was already well into it in America. 
far more than the executives knew. Don't let me go.